to start with, I would like to draw your attention to two passages from the scriptures. Let's begin with these. From the book of Acts, chapter four, we have this very famous statement about the first Christian communities. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Now, it's a very familiar passage about the unity of the Christians, the early Christian community. We caught this left and right and top and bottom in our discussions, in our dreams, in our projects about Christian unity, unity in the communities. The second is an exhortation by St. Peter, again, to Christian communities. All of you be of one mind, sympathetic, loving towards one another, compassionate, humble. Do not return evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, a blessing, because to this you were called that you might inherit a blessing. Now my question is, we speak of these dreams of the church and we speak of this passage as the ideal of the first Christian community. But my question is, how long did it last? Did this unity that we find in chapter four, did it last very long? We always have a tendency, you know, to look back to the past and see that everything was wonderful. We see that in the studies of history, um, in anthropological studies, everything we say, oh my God, you know, those times were wonderful and we are living in terrible times. Perhaps not necessarily. So look at what happened to the early Christian community almost immediately. And here are a few of them. We found that passage about unity in chapter four and chapter five opens, about, opens with an anecdote of this unity. We know these stories, I don't need to explain. Ananias and Sapphira, they sold their land, but they kept apart for themselves, they lied to the apostles and that created a conflict, led to their death, unfortunately. The very next chapter, if you look at chapter 11, we have a great conflict over receiving Gentiles to the church. In chapter 10, St. Peter, guided by the Holy Spirit, inspired by the Holy Spirit, goes to Cornelius' house and the early Christian community and its leaders just couldn't accept that. It led to a great conflict. How can we accept Gentiles into this particular Jewish faith or this particular community that was purely Jewish, supposed to be Jewish? And then we have a very interesting and very open conflict between Peter and Paul. And we find that in Galatians chapter two, Paul writes about it. Well, you know, Peter was, Peter was a, we know the character of Peter, but then he lost that kind of confidence that he had before. And Peter was playing it safe. You know, when he was with Gentiles, he would eat with the Gentiles. But then Paul found that when some messengers or some members from James' community from Jerusalem came to Antioch. Peter played it safe, you know. 
he refused to eat with the Gentiles and he ate with the Jews. And Peter called the bluff, sorry, Paul called his bluff. Paul confronted him before everybody else. Why do you do this? Why do you play? Why do you show a double face? Why do you play a double game? Conflict in the early Christian community. And then we have the conflict over the question of circumcision. We know that what led to the Jerusalem Council, whether the Jews, whether the Gentiles who are becoming Christians, should they undergo the Jewish laws and regulations? And the very same chapter ends with an open conflict between Paul and Barnabas, two great disciples, two models for the church. But Barnabas wanted to take Mark, otherwise called John, with them, with Paul and Barnabas together in their missionary journey. Paul just didn't like it. Paul didn't want at all Mark to be with them. Paul didn't find Mark to be very trustworthy. And the conflict erupted so much that Paul and Barnabas had to part ways. Now, these are all stories of the early Christian community. Shouldn't surprise us actually, you know, because we are human beings. You know, when I entered the seminary, and I'm sure that most of you can identify with this. Um, just a moment, there is a chat. Okay. Hi, <laughs> like that. Nice to see you here. You know, when I entered the seminary, and I'm sure it's the same with you, whether you entered the seminary or the convent at a very young, very tender age, I thought everybody was a saint, an angel inside, without realizing that I, as a devil, was entering the seminary with my brokenness, my limitations, my character flaws, and that is the same with everybody else. So wherever two or three are gathered, there is always conflict. Is there anyone among you who hasn't experienced conflict in your community living? If you haven't experienced, you may log off and quit the session. You don't need this session. But I believe there is nobody who hasn't experienced conflict. Partly because of our own limitations, our own human um, brokenness, and partly because of those of others. But then you know what? That's beautiful. Because unless we are people who are broken, how does God's grace enter into us? Because I tell you, grace always enters through our wounds. Well, we'll reflect more about it along these days, these two days. I would like to present before you the objectives that I would like to realize during these four hours of being together across two days. Now, I would love to do my very best to ensure that having attended this workshop on conflict transformation, you will have a certain appreciation towards conflict as a natural growth phenomenon. Conflict as a natural process in our human growing. And I hope by the end of this workshop, you will learn, you will understand the nature various levels and dynamics of conflict. You will also develop some insights into the styles of dealing with conflict of yourself, of yourselves and of others. And finally, we'll also practice, we'll also learn to practice and practicing is left to you, the skills for transforming conflicts into growth moments. And some of the um, skills we would see would be skills for presencing how to act from the future. I'll be depending on theory U for that. And then the skills for compassionate communication. I'll be depending on the insights of, the, of Rosenberg, a wonderful model, and of Amen communication. And they will also be looking at various models for reflection and action based on the biblical, congregational, and spiritual traditions that we have. And you will also have some homeworks to do. So at the end of the session today, I'll be assigning a few homeworks, which are very much necessary. And I urge you now itself that you must do them before we come together for the next session on 9th. I know that you have 
you are completing the session on leadership tomorrow with Jolanda Kafka, my good friend. Uh, and then, you know, you are free for the next um, six, seven days. So it, it wouldn't take much time of yours to do these homeworks, but doing that will help us learn better in the coming days. So let us get to the first point. Conflict as a natural growth phenomenon. You know, conflict is necessary. It's a necessary dynamic in human growth, biologically, emotionally, and spiritually. If not, how do we grow? How do we mature as people? You know, a body without conflict is dead. Where do you find human bodies that have absolutely no conflict? Those who have perfect homeostasis balance, you will find them only in the cemeteries. But that's not where we want to be. You know, biologically, the body grows when there is a particular growth need. There's a particular context that challenges us and the body responds by adjusting itself. And thus we grow in spurts because of the conflicts it encounters internally and externally. Without that, there is no growth. We will be just standard. You will be no different from a stone or a building or a bridge because they have no conflicts. The same applies to our emotional life. You know, we have lots of stories about suicides now. Uh, Father Robinson, I worked in Arunachal Pradesh. I was there for eight years. Now the tribal communities, we wonder, you know, they are very nice, love, loving people, wonderful people. The modern technology hasn't affected them much, the modern civilization. But I tell you, one year when I was there, there were 12 suicides in that village, including four in a day. What was happening? Some of the, it, this happens all over, you know, in some families now, whatever the children want, we provide them. They have a need, we provide them. They want a mobile of 40,000 um, rupees, we buy and give them. You know, they don't necessarily experience a conflict between a, a want of theirs and a no from the parents. And then what happens is, is that they reach a point wherein they demand something and the parents or the world cannot respond. Their demands are so great that the world simply cannot respond and they have never experienced such a conflict that their ego hasn't developed the strength to deal with the conflict, it just disintegrates. And there is no, there is nothing before them than commit suicide. I had an experience of one uh, class 12 student when I was teaching in Bangalore, and this is in a Bangalore city, he asked for a bicycle and the parents couldn't afford, he committed suicide. Now, sometimes what happens is because we do not frustrate the demands of children, and this can happen even in formation houses, you know, there are formators who would like to please the students every time to get into the good books of the students and therefore always say yes to whatever they ask for. And they never experience some necessary conflicts in their growth. And when they have to experience a conflict, they collapse. So even for our emotional becoming, conflicts are necessary. And spiritually too, you know, we have an ideal about religious life personally and as communities, but the actual is always a bit below the ideal. Well, of course, ideals are ideals precisely because they're ideals, you know, they are not realized often. So there is always a gap between the ideal and the actual, which creates conflict, which is necessary. Only then we will actually find, only then we'll actually seek out how to bridge this gap between the ideal and the actual. Life is to be managed by managing such gaps. So we can look at so many examples about why the conflict is necessary as a biological organism, as an emotional, psychological organism, as a spiritual organism, as an interpersonal community as well, as societies. They say, you know, sometimes God places some people 
in our lives in the community precisely because they irritate us. And because they irritate us, they are actually revealing some areas where we haven't actually matured. So thank God for them. They actually create conflict in us so that we can actually look at ourselves, recognize our weak points, and then grow better. Merriam Webster's has this uh, dictionary has this definition regarding conflict. It refers to a mental struggle resulting from incompatible or opposing needs, drives, wishes, or internal demands. Now, you simply cannot collapse conflict into a single definition. So it actually gives us several definitions and I have taken just two of them. You will see at different levels what they mean. So at one level, it's an internal struggle that we have resulting from opposing needs we have. I have a need to study, but the provincial sense, I have a need to serve in the missions also. But these are opposing needs. I can't do both. Or I have certain drives, wishes, and all these compete with each other and that creates conflict in me. So competitive or opposing actions or in incompatibles antagonistic states or actions as if as of divergent ideas, interests, or persons, etc. Well, in one sense, Adam Grant is a psychologist, a quite a famous one. His comment, this sentence, I find it to be very, very revealing and truthful. The absence of conflict is not harmony. It is apathy. If you are in a group, where people never disagree, the only way that could really happen is if people don't care enough to speak their minds. If everything is perfectly all right in your religious community, that's a problem. Because it wasn't okay even in the earliest Christian communities. It's when we do care for one another that we begin to disagree. We begin to feel affected by the behavior of others. See, if I don't care for somebody, what, what does it matter how he behaves? I don't care. It's when I care that conflicts happen. So the absence of conflict is not peace or harmony. It is sheer indifference. Now with these introductory um, reflections, what I would like to present before you are a few types of conflicts. Now, some of you, uh, you know, some of you may be quite um, knowledgeable about these things, but you know, people may be at very different levels, you know. Some of you are um, students, I know, maybe novices as well. So I'm just keeping it uh, fairly simple so that everybody can um, follow what uh, we are reflecting together today. So I hope some of you, those who are much more knowledgeable, do not feel bored, okay? Let's begin with, Kurt Levin's uh, typology of conflicts. We can define conflicts at various levels, various types. So we take a couple of them. One type of conflict, Kurt Levin speaks about three kinds of conflicts or three types of conflicts. One is approach avoidance conflict. What is approach avoidance conflict? Well, you have one particular thing before you, an object before you. You have an attraction towards it. You have an aversion towards it. And that creates conflict. You love it and you hate it. That's so much of tension within, you know. Maybe you can think of some examples in your mind. <clears throat> Let me give you a couple of examples. Take your family life. The husband and wife. The husband loves the wife for so many things. At the same time, the husband hates the wife for so many things and vice versa. And this, is, this typically happens in very intimate relationships, you know. You love and hate the same person. It happens in communities. It happens in communities. You love and hate your member. You love your superior, 
and you hate your superior as well. You love your companion at work, you hate your companion at work. What do you do? You just can't get rid of the person. And you don't want to get rid of the person. It creates a lot of conflict. In this context, you know, let me share with you, um, this is a true incident, okay, because uh, it was to me that this particular religious told um, a member of a congregation, well, these are two priests, religious priests working in a mission, not clericians, okay, but I won't mention the congregation anyway. This younger one had so much of appreciation for his superior. At the same time, he hated the superior because the superior was extremely autocratic. There was no democratic decision-making. He decided everything for the younger member of the, who was a priest as well, his assistant. The assistant didn't have any voice. So over several couple of years, you know, this man started harboring so much hatred for the superior. And one day he told me, and I thought he was joking, but he wasn't. He said, Father Paulson, if I can get a gun, if I ever get a gun, the first thing I would do is to shoot my superior dead. Shouldn't be surprising. You might have heard um, similar comments from different people. There was, a, there was a story about a couple that I, that I read about. I do not know whether it is just a story or a true incident. It seems a priest was guiding a retreat for couples who have lived together for 25 years, silver jubilee of their married life. So at one moment, in the, it was only the couples present there. So the priest asked, while asking so many things, he asked the couples, tell us honestly, during this 25 years of living together, at any point of time, did you feel tempted to break the sixth commandment? And you know what it is. It's breaking fidelity to the other. It's committing adultery. So the priest was asking, did you ever feel like breaking the sixth commandment? So it seems one lady put up the hand and she got up and she, and she said, Father, never the fifth commandment but the, never the sixth commandment, but the fifth commandment so many times. And you know what the fifth commandment is? Do not kill. So in intimate relationships, this can happen. Yeah? So much of love, hate relationships, approach avoidance conflict. Another simple example would be, you know, you want to go for studies, at the same time, you don't want to go for studies or you want to go to some extreme uh, outlandish mission area and you have so many fears and anxieties about you know, living in such an area. You want to go to Afghanistan, your missionary, missionary instincts invited you to go to Afghanistan. At the same time, you are scared of the present situations there. So the same object, it, you, have, you feel like approaching it, you feel like avoiding it. The next is double approach conflict. Here you have two objects, and you are interested in both. And the example I have shown there is, must be pretty similar for all, but pretty familiar for all of us, you know? Whether you want to become a priest or you want to get married. Well, this can be a challenge. This can be highly conflictual for some of the students who are in formation, you know? especially before deciding about the final professions, you know? A great attraction for family life and a great attraction for priestly life. Which one should I choose? You know, you feel like approaching both, but you cannot have both. So this creates a lot of conflict. I am reminded of a good friend of mine, uh, my novitiate batch, a wonderful man. I have seen him when he was discerning. He just couldn't sleep, lie down, sit down. Every night he would be on the terrace walking back and forth. Just couldn't come to a decision because he was burning inside. He just couldn't decide between two choices that he deeply loved. Very familiar conflict for us. And then we have what is called double, double avoidance conflict. Now, double avoidance is the opposite of, you know, uh, double approach conflict, wherein you don't want to do, you have two objects and you hate both. Yeah. 
you hate both. But you're forced to choose between one. A simple example that many women go through sometimes is, you know, um, if they are diagnosed with cancer, breast cancer, should they opt for chemotherapy or should they go for double mastectomy? The doctor offers two options. There's no other option available and both are extremely painful, negative options. You want to avoid both, but you can't. So we suffer, we are in conflict, mental pain. Conflict is all about psychic pain that we have, you know? Or in our community living, you know, the provincial tells you, you are assigned to community A, you are all, you can choose community B, and you hate both communities because of the members who are present there. But you're forced to choose. It's double avoidance conflict. Or the provincial offers you two ministries and you hate both. What do you do? So these are some kinds of conflicts, so three major kinds of conflicts that uh, we often go through in our daily life. You know, At every moment, we are asked to choose. And its choice is always painful, you know? And sometimes what we do is we delay the choice, you know? We delay the choice. We just refuse to choose. But refusing to choose is also a choice with worse consequences, you know? For sometimes it might be convenient, it might be advised as well, but we simply cannot keep on delaying a choice. We have to make a decision. Well, another way to look at conflicts would be in terms of task, relationship, and values. Now, this happens when uh, very much related to the ministries that we have. As an example, you know, here you have a, you have a cartoon here. It's an office situation. Every team in the company has to work with marketing. How? Now, the top management tells you have to work with marketing but they have no idea how to go about doing this task. There are so many opinions in the company that you simply cannot arrive at a consensus as to how to go about doing this particular task. Now apply to the ministries that we have. You know? Now we have, let us say the congregation has made an option for being in the margins. Now, how do we realize this mission of being on the margins of the society, in the, in the frontiers that Pope Francis wants us to go? How to go about doing it? Should we immediately go to a slum or to a tribal area and set up buildings? Should it be through education? Or should it be through social development? Or should it be through women empowerment? And if these are the ones, how do we go about doing it? Conflicts related to task not necessarily because of the people involved, okay? And this is normal, you know, this is normal. In chapters and assemblies, we sometimes have a lot of heated discussions about how to go. I still remember that some of the heated discussions we had when option for the poor was the big theme at some particular moment for our lives, for our congregation, for our provinces. Now, this is a good conflict, you know, because if you don't have conflict, again, I said it's because we don't care. If we don't come and discuss, if you don't have heated idea or arguments, it's because we just don't care. Because we care, because we care for the ministry, for the priorities of the congregation, we have conflicts. We just have to see how to go about dealing with these conflicts. The second would be relationship conflicts. Well, um, this is what we normally go through. Um, wherein the people, we have issues with the people with whom we work, with whom we live, with whom we, we, we you know, share our daily life and ministry. Sometimes, especially these days, you know, we have, uh, the congregations are losing numbers. So in many communities, we have uh, people from, for example, abroad and all. We have now no vocations happening. So we bring people from different countries and then these are all intercultural communities. So much of conflict because people don't understand the background from which these people come, 
the people who come they are not familiar with the conflicts of the, language, the culture of the language where they are so it leads a lot of relationship conflicts you know that already it doesn't need much explanation the next is value conflict now this is important relationship conflict task conflict now let's say that we have good relationship we are friends we are loving brothers and sisters in the community and with regards to task we have some sense of the task we want to be out there for the poor working on the margins but sometimes there can come value conflicts and i don't have to explain this in india we are actually going through a lot of value conflicts now we are we are fighting values related to secularism we are fighting values related to religious fundamentalism and in some corners of of the indian church we are now struggling with you know um fundamentalism in certain communities some are up in arms against fundamentalism in uh, hinduism some are up in arms against fundamentalism in the muslim communities some are up in arms against the fundamentalism in christian communities yeah and then there are so many conflicts happening within the com- religious communities has to how to, how to respond to these kind of challenges yeah so regarding the values it could be religious values it could be congregational values it could be personal values that we cherish let me give you an example and you might resonate with this let us say that we have a school and many of the religious in india we run schools because education is extremely important it's a, it's a, it's an integral ministry for us and then we have some problem with the board of education there's a cbsc we are not getting recognition and then some of us want to give bribes to get the recognition and some are against it's a value conflict those who support giving bribes would say you know what in india nothing works without bribes you know it's so corrupt we are democratically corrupt and if you don't pay the bribes we don't get the recognition how and our students suffer and those who have those who are against giving bribes would say you know what means cannot uh, the the ends cannot justify the means we simply cannot become party to this corruption culture i say that we should stand the ground we should refuse to pay bribes we should sit in dharna before the cbse office yeah or whatever office we may have to suffer and by that we should become a prophetic sign for the, for the, for the, for the society now these are value conflicts not necessarily bad values not necessarily a bad value against a good value but both are good values you know because those who support are looking at the value of supporting the these children who are going to sit in the exams their future caring for them so how do we reconcile these value conflicts so we experience all these kinds of values in our religious life now this kind of conflicts happen at different levels at one level is the intra personal conflict conflict within myself you know people who go around happy smiling they are not necessarily people who are at peace within themselves just because somebody is happy gets along well with everybody doesn't mean that this person is not suffering inside people carry a lot of struggles with them we have splits in our in our in our minds you know maybe between certain desires maybe between certain values that are internal to us maybe maybe we are suffering some conflict because of some sins of the past which we haven't reckon, which we which god has forgiven us but we haven't forgiven ourselves so much of intrapersonal conflict this can also mean the conflict that happens because of our unconscious motivations just for example somebody may have a homosexual orientation and he is getting aware of it and in religious life you know sometimes we have extremely negative attitude towards such people as if they are already living a homosexual life and the church actively discourages uh, recruiting people with homo deep seated homosexual orientation and this boy or this girl is confused totally 
is my orientation right is it just peripheral or is it just deep rooted what should i do whom should i talk to and some of these our formation platforms unfortunately do not give an opportunity for people we do not trust people we do not give that trust to our candidates to openly share this kind of struggles it could be a matter of sometimes an infatuation with somebody outside opposite sex or it could be doubts about one's own vocation so so many intrapersonal conflicts that are happening within it could be because of the family situation that one is undergoing which we do not know nobody knows and then we have interpersonal conflict i don't need to explain all this you know that already you know? between two people interpersonal conflicts and then there is intra group conflict like let us say that within the community we have conflicts or in the assembly in the provincial provincial assembly or chapter it's the same group but we have tensions within it could be task related it could be relationship related it could be value related conflicts and then there is inter group conflicts between two groups it can happen between two sorry two provinces it can happen between two congregations yeah two congregations they are working together but there are lots of difference of opinions and then they find it difficult to get along one pretends to leave so intergroup tension so it all really um, leads to so many kinds of conflicts this can also happen at the level of you know we are just discussing at the level of religious communities it can happen at the level of uh, wider societies as well between churches between rights it can happen between countries between bishops conferences it can happen well so these are essentially um, some information insights into the type of conflicts first we spoke in terms of you know kurt lewin's uh, um, typology double approach double avoidance and approach avoidance conflicts and these themselves can be multiples okay this double approach can be many things not just two things it could be many uh, uh, possibilities uh, in front of us you know what maybe incidentally as i remember um just two minutes i will just share with you about a wonderful study that was um, conducted a few years ago when we have so many choices you know conflict increases there is a wonderful study that was conducted uh, in the united states you know what they did we have all these um, what do we say malls you know the supermarket we say that we think that when we have so many opportunities ah, we have so many things to choose from life is so easy it isn't easy it is more messy so what this researchers did was they picked up a particular um jam and they offered six varieties of this jam okay six companies that means six options six choices for different brands of jam and they increased the options in some counters in some places they offered up to 24 brands of jam so the the, the range was from six brands of jam to 24 brands of jam and they they did it in different places in different manner you know what they found whenever 24 up to 24 was offered the people who tasted the samples you know there is a desk where you can actually taste you know people go and taste these various jams and based on their testing they choose which jam to buy the researchers found that when they were given too many brands to choose from invariably the customers did not buy the jam and in the research what they found was when the options were given all up to 6 of course they gave from 1 okay 1 to 24 up to when the options were given up to 6 there was always a statistically significant possibility of customers buying that jam so what does it mean when you have more options your mind is so confused you simply do not know what to do what to choose from and you mentally you freeze and you don't choose so sometimes having you know you, you go to a, a shop to buy mobile phones there are 20 varieties of mobile phones 
the possibility is that you might not buy. You walk into a, a, a place to where the, they have only four or five varieties, you might end up buying. It's easier to decide. It might, forget about mobiles, you know, when you walk in to buy a, a cloth, pants or a shirt or a skirt or something, if there are too many options, you're confused. If they offer you only a few options, it's easier. The conflict, the internal conflict is less. Well, let, me, let us move on to now, how do we deal with these conflicts? Now, you must be, uh, I hope you are all listening attentively. I would like to present to you an exercise and we will do that shortly in another 10 minutes. You will break into breakout rooms. Uh, so listen to this carefully, um, watch this carefully. I'm going to present before you some personal styles of dealing with group conflicts. Now this is, I'm adapting this from a wonderful book on peace building, a Caritas training manual. Now this is freely downloadable from the internet, this particular book, Peace Building, a Caritas training manual with so many exercises. So I'm adapting this exercise from them, but I have changed a few here and there to make it more relevant for us. Now, what they say, what Hope and Timel say is that we all have personal styles of dealing with group conflicts. And think in terms of your communities, okay? The communities you live in, how do you deal with the conflicts that affect everybody? And each style can be presented in terms of an animal, nature of an animal. Nothing offensive to the animals, these are all wonderful animals, but they also typify a typical style of, you know, behavior. Some of us are like donkeys, you know, stubborn, refusal to change one's point of view. So we have the community meeting happening. There are some decisions to be arrived at, some comp compromises to be made, some have to give up, but some, some people, some of us, you know, are very stubborn. They simply stick to their point of view. Even if others point out holes in their arguments, mm -hmm. You know, you might think like, what donkey is that, you know? Now, please don't apply to anybody else as you're listening to me. Don't think of some of your community members, please. Think of yourself. Is this my style? And that's important. When people read, um, you know, a medical journal, when you look at diabetes or cholesterol, you are reading all those symptoms in order to find out whether you have it. But when people read books on psychological disorders, we tend to read to find out whether my community member has that so that we can label and you know, stereotype them. Don't do that. Apply this to uh, yourselves. Do I behave like a donkey, very stubborn? Is it my style? Or am I like a lion? Very calm, very dignified. But the moment somebody disagrees with my view, I jump in, I intervene and I fight. If nobody disagrees with me, I don't care. I just sit there watching the game played out by everybody else. But anytime somebody criticizes or attacks my point of view, I just can't tolerate it. I fight, I create a scene. Am I like this? Well, here are two more animals for you. Are you an elephant? Always blocking the way always preventing the group from any forward movement in resolution. So there are some solutions, people are offering some solutions, but then you find problems with that. Like, you know, somebody says, okay, how about we doing it this way? You immediately say, no, but. Then another person says, oh, let's do it then this way. And you say, no, but. Always butting in, yeah? Blocking the road like an elephant. And so much so, the group is not capable of arriving at any solution finally, you know? Finding faults with everything, all kinds of solutions that are, pro that are proposed. Or oh, are you like a rabbit? Totally withdrawn from any group effort to resolve conflict. Very gentle, but doesn't want to face conflict and completely withdrawn, seated in a corner. You know, sometimes we have community members like this. We have the community meeting. Everybody is sharing their ideas. 
but there are some one or two members who are just there as if they don't belong there, totally withdrawn, maybe because of fear, maybe because of you know, lack of care, whatever it is. Do I play this role? Two more animals for you. Am I like an ostrich, refusing to face the reality and denies conflict? You know, I don't even want to acknowledge that there is conflict in the community. It's like, you know, when the, when the provincial, or when I, let's say that there's an assembly in the province, they're asking for community reports. And you, when you read the community reports, you wonder, oh my God, there is no better community in our province. This is like heaven on earth. Because the report denies all conflicts. It denies all problems. It simply paints a picture that is so beautiful, harmonious, almost unreal. Like the reading from Acts chapter four, you know, the ideal Christian community. So like an ostrich, they are living with their head in the sand, refusing to face reality. It doesn't help because we don't grow, we don't become mature. Then are we like tortoise, the Goslo type, you know? We, we, I mean, it's not total withdrawal, but it's extremely very slow, yeah? It doesn't keep pace with the community, yeah? Maybe these are some people who come late for the meetings, a very important meeting for the community. The guy comes very late. And then when something begins to hurt the person, withdraws the head into the shell, shuts within one's shell. So it's very slow, very slow to participate, very slow to contribute, and withdraws whenever it is threatened. Another two categories would be chameleon. Changes color according to people and situations. Takes sides that suits him or her. You know, it's like they go with anybody, you know. One member says one suggestion, ah, that's good, let's do that. Then another member says something else and he says, yeah, let's do that. And also, wherever you know, the power is focused, they tend to take sides with the power for their own benefit. So they're not objectively analyzing or contributing to the, uh, to the solution. They're not objectively analyzing the problem and contributing to the solution. They're simply taking sides for, you know, painting themselves in the same color of the environment that they are in. So they talk to you, let's say that um, this kind of person, chameleon calls one person and then you know, they talk in love to superior. And then this guy goes to the superior and talks in love to the person taking sides with the superior and, and uh, you know, agreeing with everything that the superior says. And the assistant superior, he has another phase. He takes his side, criticizing the superior, you know, changing sides. Or are you like an eagle? The wise guy, the know-it-all, talks in long words, more talk than action, you know? Looks very intelligent, very smart, full of experience, flies high, he pretends to have a very wide perspective. So he's the guy who offers very wise solutions. And at the, at, at beneath that, there is a contempt for the opinions and suggestions of others. Am I like that? The know it all guy. Two more. Am I like a rat, a mouse? Poor self image, too timid, very shy to share opinion, and sometimes plays the victim. Now, this is because the rat doesn't want, this person doesn't want to share. He wants to, or she wants to, but she feels, um, you know, like a victim. She feels very insignificant a false sense of humility. Who, who am I? Who am I to say my opinion? And so much of shyness within to share opinion. Poor self-image, timidity. Or are you like a whale? It's my way or highway. Yeah. Insists on one single solution. A problem may have different solutions. Not all solutions may be perfect. There may not be a single perfect solution. So we may have to even look at different solutions to be applied at different moments. But this guy, 
into his son, his way of solving. They accept this or get out of the way. You know, sharks can even, even, even swallow other people or smaller members of the community. And finally, we have this favorite guy we have in our community sometimes, the clown in the group, fools around, chatters, makes silly observations, prevents the group from serious work. Now, people who play the clown, you know, so much of tension in the community meeting. So this guy begins to, you know, pop fun. You know, uh, we are discussing serious matters, but then he, he robs the meeting of the seriousness by cracking jokes and making fun of some of the suggestions, some of the solutions offered. Yeah. So it's just fooling around, making silly observations, and finally prevents the group from serious work. Now, my brothers and sisters, uh, whatever I shared so far are, oh, I'm sorry. There is a message from Sister Christine that uh, there is some, um, I hope you can hear me well. The connection in my part is quite good. So maybe you might want to look at your connectivity problem, um, connectivity strength, if some words are getting cut, okay? Fine, thank you for letting me you know. I'll try to speak slower too, so that you don't miss any words. Now I just, uh, oh, okay, thanks for the job who said I'm clear. Fine, maybe in some places the connectivity might be poor. You know? Now, you know, what I, thank you, what I suggest, what I was telling you so far, were all negative things about these images. But please know, all this is not negative. There are times we may have to play some of these roles. And that is where flexibility of dealing with conflicts in communities will come up. Now, this is a half serious, but half joking um, reflection on personal styles. And we'll do an exercise right now, but after the breakout sessions, you know, we will, we will also reflect about using a particular scale, a theory that speaks about five different ways of dealing with conflicts. So one thing that is important is sometimes we may have to play these roles. Well, sometimes, you know, for example, one member in the community has a very serious, a very good solution that the community is not able to understand at that moment. He may insist on the solution. He may insist on the solution because, well, he has studied it well. So he might appear stubborn, refusing to change the point of view, but he might be right. So this is where the, the, the strength of conviction comes, okay? There are times when you may have to intervene when somebody else has a different point of view. There are times when you may have to really block the way of one particular solution that the community is discussing. Let's say the bribe issue. Well, you might, you might be convinced enough sometimes to block it. And there are also times when you might, it is necessary that you withdraw. Maybe you have been speaking so much that maybe it is good to play the rabbit a bit, withdraw a bit and let others speak. Yeah, there are times we may have to just forget about the conflict for the time being, not forever, okay, for the time being and get, you know, we have this particular event happening and then communities and attention and we say, you know, for the next one week, let us forget about it. Let's forget about the conflict we have. Let's get this even done and then we will come back and we'll discuss it. There might be occasions where we may have to go slow. There might be occasions just to listen to people and say, aha, uh -huh, this is what you think. Maybe you have, a, you, have a, you have a point there. And there are times some wise guys may have something nice to say. Well, you don't have to play the victim, but sometimes, you know, it's better not to share the opinion at one particular moment. And sometimes you may have to play the clown, you know? The entire community is so serious 
And then maybe that's a moment just to, you know, lighten the moment a bit, play the monkey for the sake of everybody so that the tension releases, the balloon of tension breaks and people can laugh a bit, you know, turn to one another, smile and have a cup of coffee. So all these roles have good elements and not so good elements. But at the same time, some of these roles can be our typical way of dealing with conflicts in community. What does it tell about you? What does it tell about how the community is helped or prevented? Now let us look at this personal conflict style inventory, which is originally based on Thomas Kilman's study, his um, theorizing, and then also modified by Kreville. Now at the end of the day, I will be sending you free materials more. Yeah. Um, Father Robin will email you immediately after the session, three materials. One of that materials would be this personal conflict style inventory. And I would like you to take this particular test and bring the results to the next session on 9th. But let me explain the theory now. It's pretty simple and very insightful as well. Now, when we deal with conflicts, Look at the two axes we have here. At the bottom, the kind of style that we use can be high or low on relationship. And on the y-axis, the vertical axis, we have a goal-focused style, which is all about being assertive. Now, these two, are always operational, meaning when we have a conflict in community, we deal with the conflict in terms of our relationships and in terms of the task at hand. So with regards to the task or the goal at hand, we could be focused on it at a very high level or at a very low level, meaning we give very high importance to the work, the task at hand, or we simply, you know, keep it aside. The other dimension is the relationship between the members that we have, yeah? The level of cooperation that we, that we have and we want to achieve. We can give great importance to that level of cooperation, maintaining the relationship, or we might just discard that relationship cooperation level and focus exclusively on the goal. To use an example, let us say that in the community, I'm just using the same example that I used before, there is a tension about this permission from the school board, what sort of a solution we should have and people are split in their ideas. Now we can discuss, we can deal with this conflict in the community in terms of maintaining relationship, not breaking relationship among people, members, at the same time, focusing on the goal as well. And depending upon whether these are high or low, we have five levels of style, sorry, five styles of conflict resolution styles possible or approach possible. And each of us might be using one particular type given our personality or maybe even more than one, depending. So let us look at those styles here. One is at the top left corner is authoritative style. Is my style authoritative? Oh, sorry for the spelling mistake there. What it means is that I use my force, my authority, my position in the community, or in the ministry, or in the institution. And I force a solution on the parties involved. I'm imposing my solution down. It's top down, solu top down solution to the conflict that we have. Now look at that position of the authoritative style. It's very high on the goal focusedness. It's very high on the assertiveness. Yeah, so on the X, on the, on the Y axis, it is coming at the top. 
It is also coming at the low level of relationships. I'm not giving importance to my relationship. It's low. I'm not thinking of maintaining cooperation. It's low. I want the work done. I want the task done. So I put down my foot. I say, this is the solution. You accept it or reject it. Now, some religious may have this style in their personality. Any issue comes up, whatever that is, personal issue or task-oriented issue or value-oriented issue, this is one way to solve. Now, sometimes this is an easy way to solve, you know, because if somebody takes the leadership and they give the solutions, well, it's easy. Others just need to, need to follow the solutions. If this kind of style is the predominant style, and if the person is as it's a provincial or a superior or a principal or a director or a parish priest or whatever, yeah, this can give solutions. But the problem is there may be so many hearts broken in the process. The relationship is badly affected. People might be left wounded, whom we call the wounded soldiers in communities. Well, another one, look at the lower left column. Again, the relationship is not a focus. I'm sorry, there are several spelling mistakes in this. I didn't realize that. The relationship is still is, is not the focus again. They're not bothered about having good cooperation or maintaining relationships, not interested. At the same time, they are not goal focused either. It is low. That particular box comes at the, under, at the lower end of assertiveness, goal focus behavior, and the lower end of relationship focus. And that style is called avoidance style. These kind of people, they just want to avoid problems. Yeah. Again, like having the head in the sand, you know. They either deny the reality of conflict or withdraw from resolving it temporarily or permanently. Because they don't want to, you know, just avoid, you know, don't get into problems. Some people cannot take stress, you know, they cannot take stress. So it's like delay the solution, delay the solution. Suppose it's about an intra-psychic conflict within about a vocational discernment. They keep avoiding the uh, the solution, you know, just avoiding, avoiding. Or in the community, there is tension. You know, nobody wants to speak openly. Nobody wants to really correct the person. Nobody wants to discuss the problem that is bothering everybody else. Just avoid. So what happens is nobody grows from that. The community doesn't grow as mature individuals, mature, mature religious. They remain at a very adolescent level. And at the same time, the work doesn't get done. The goal is not realized. Avoidance style. Now we come to the right side, bottom part. The right side, bottom part, we have the accommodating style. Now we play down the differences and accommodate everyone's views. Now accommodate means I make space for everybody's views. I try to yes, say yes, yes, yes to everybody, yeah. I like to make sure that people are not wounded, yeah. But at the cost of what? At the cost of solving the problem. So look at it, this is high on relationship, on cooperation, but that is very low on realizing the goal, whether it is ministry, whether it is a school issue, whether it is whatever, yeah. The goal is forgotten for the sake of protecting individual for the sake of not, not hurting anybody. So let's say that, you know, there is a problem person in the community. Nobody wants to, you know, upset the still waters. It's okay, you know, we will just take care of him. And they forget the God, the ministry that is assigned to him. He's not doing the ministry and nobody bothers, you know, you just take care of and do whatever you want to do, whatever you can do. So. The task gets affected, but the relationship is maintained. So we are sacrificing the task, we are sacrificing the mission or the ministry for the sake of just having peace in the community. And then there is collaborating style. 
This has the highest end of both. Work with others towards a solution that meets the needs of everyone involved. Meaning it is high on relationship, it is high on goal focus. Uh, goal focus. Yeah. We are focusing on the goal. We want to get the work done. We also want to protect the relationship among the members in the community. And therefore it is a collaborating style. So we are willing to work with others we are willing to take risk at the same time, making sure that nobody is hurt in the process. Yeah. We make sure that everybody is listened to. At the same time, we want to work out a solution. This final solution may not be, you know, not everybody may be 100% happy with the final solution, but at least people can live with that solution. So the question is, okay, you have a different opinion, but can you still live with it? If everybody can live with that particular decision, fine. So that is the high part of the goal focused as well as relationship focus. There is one more style that is possible. That is compromising style. We bargain with parties concerned for a give and take solution to the conflict. We compromise, yeah? So that's sort of a middle path it's not too high on the focus on the goal. It's not too high on the relationship, but it is compromised, remains at the center. Yeah. Is that a good style? Now the question is, which is the best style among all these? Well, it looks like the best style is collaborating style. Well, because you are protecting the relationship, you're also protecting the goal, the work, the ministry or the mission at hand. Definitely that, that sounds the best among all these, but that also demands a lot of skills, foundational skills and specific skills for dealing with conflicts. That would be our focus in the next session on 9th of October. How can we develop some of these skills, foundational skills as well as specific, specialized skills by which we can actually be highly productive in our ministry, yeah, in the mission of the community, of the province, or the congregation, at the same time, take care of the relationships. It costs a lot of maturity, but we arrive at that maturity by practicing skills. So next session will be completely focused on the skills that we need to develop for doing this. Now, let us not forget that other styles are not bad. There are occasions when we might need other styles. There might be occasions where in a compromising style might be the best in that given position, in that given context. There might be an occasion where an accommodating style might work the best. So we don't say that any of this style is bad. Generally speaking, collaborating style is the best. More often than not, or nine out of 10 times, if you can adopt the collaborating style, the best. But there are occasions wherein the situation might demand an authoritative style. For example, there's an emergency. This is an accident. Someone has to be very authoritative. That's not the time to convene a meeting and to listen to everybody and to ask for opinions and to come, to come to a compromise. Someone has to take the leadership, give orders that others simply follow when there's an emergency. There might be an occasion where we may have to, for the time being, avoid dealing with the problem. Maybe we just delay dealing with the problem so that we have more information on that particular issue yeah, we can have some time to study the issue before we bring it to the table. There might be occasions where we, we may have to be a bit accommodating. Yeah, perhaps because of the various levels that people are at. We may have to, we have to compromise the goal a bit. Or there might be occasions when compromise is time might be what is needed at that given moment in that given context. Now, the test that you will be receiving at the end, it will be asking you specific situations, 
wherein how you will respond. So you will get that at the end. Let me also bring, because the authors of this particular style also make use of animal totems because, you know, we are very close to animals. We are part of animals anyway. So some of these figures actually capture yeah, our dynamics. So the top left part, you have the whale, the authoritative style. We saw that already, the way. He might, his decisions might be unpopular, his or her decisions might be unpopular, but maybe necessary. There are times when a provincial or a superior may have to put his head, put his foot down and say, well, we have listened to everybody, but I think this is what we are going to do. Maybe an unpopular decision, but necessary in the given context. Then there is this tortoise guy at the lower level. That is what we saw, the avoidance style. Rarely, if ever, makes a decision. Yeah. Avoids decision because of whatever reason, maybe internal personality reasons or relational reasons or the context of the work, whatever it is. The person doesn't make any decision as such as to resolve the conflict. Is it good? Generally, no. But some occasions, we may have to play the tortoise. The third on this side is all about teddy bear, you know, the teddy bear. Yeah, it feels very nice to hug, sleep with a teddy bear, you know, children do that. We lose the battle, but win the war in terms of relationships. The goal is forgotten, the work is forgotten, but we have a very nice cozy cozy relationship in the community. You're very happy. I massage your back, you massage my back. Yeah, it's nice. But the problem is sometimes you might, you might simply remain adolescents. And in religious life, sometimes I tell you, we are in a prolonged adolescent stage. You don't grow up to become adults, to become mature, to face the pain of taking decisions. Because when we decide something, we have to let go of something else, you know? That's not easy for children. They want to have the candy and eat it too. And sometimes it is, you know, easy to remain uh, like a child. And we, some of us remain children, you know, all throughout our religious life. Now, interesting thing is today's reading for the mass is about becoming like children, you know? My brother in the community who was presiding over the mass today, he was uh, preaching in Spanish, but then he brought English in between because in English we have this difference between being childish and being childlike. So he was telling the students, uh, I live in a, a student community here. So this formator was telling the students, you know what Jesus is telling today is not about being childish. It's about being childlike. Well, we have to be childlike, but not childish. Well, childish would mean, you know, not wanting to, you know, not bothered about the goals, but only bothered about, you know, the candy that we have. But there are also occasions wherein we may have to be a bit childlike. There are occasions wherein we may have to protect the relationship because of the given context or the work. You will find the questions related to this in the, in the, in the test. Then we have low impact compromises. Yeah, we make compromises. We already saw that compromising style without hurting people at the same time. No, we are not, we are not too bothered about uh, keeping the relationship the best, but we compromise there and we compromise on the y-axis too. We don't think of doing that particular thing to the best of our ability, but somehow manage it without hurting anybody, you know? So, and finally, the highest, um, the, the, the right side, top, long-term planning and team efforts, mm -hmm. which is what we already saw as the collaborating style, wherein we have to really grow up. We have to think in terms of long-term goals, long-term consequences. We have to think in terms of taking everybody together, working as a team. And that's where we, I mean, like I said, this is the most ideal style we should have but there are occasions wherein we may have to 
uh, have other styles as well. Now the homework, one of the homeworks, which I want to mention now that I already mentioned to you is about this PSCI test. So Father Robin will email to you, take this test. It's a, it's a very simple test. It gives you specific occasions, yeah? It's all about you. It's asking you questions. If you are in such a situation, what would your response be? Or this kind of response, will you do that never or sometimes or most often or always? So these options are given. I'm sure you have taken so many simple psychological tests and very simple tests with a few questions. Just honestly answer them. What is important is answer these questions honestly. Okay. PCSI, somebody for the, somebody's asking the question. PCSI is exactly this, you know, what I mentioned. Um, personal Conflict Style Inventory, PCSI. That's the name of the test. Yeah, the Crable version that I'll be emailing you. Just a short form. So what's important is you answer this honestly without censoring because um, it's, it's for our own sake. Just take the test with all openness. Don't think too much about it. One thing about psychological test is when you read something, don't think too much. Because when you think too much, you are censoring already your answers. You want to give a socially pleasing answer. So always the instruction is give the answer as it occurs to you spontaneously. And that would be unedited, uncensored. And then at the end of the test, it tells you how to tabulate the scores. <clears throat> and please be uh, careful there because the test has two sections, meaning when you are in a calm situation, meaning the problems are not intense, okay? It's asking about your normal style of behaving. So when, when you are in a calm situation, what is your style of responding to problems? But there are also situations of emergency, you know, a hard situation. So in such situations, what would be your style of dealing with that? So it looks at two different situations. So at the end, you will find scoring about hard situations and calm situations. And then they will ask you to add up these scores. So now don't read the scores. Don't go to the um, tabulation of scores initially, you just, open the PDF file, start answering the questions. And at the end, you look at how to tabulate the scores. It's fairly simple, but if you need the help of somebody else, and if you feel confused, ask some of your community members to tabulate the scores and uh, bring that scores to the next session. Okay, we will explain more of that later. Now, so we're talking so far about individual responses to conflicts that we have in communities. We have 13 minutes to go. Let me briefly introduce John Paul Lederach's model. Now, John Paul Lederach is a world famous guy in peace education. Not only in peace education, not just in education, but being out there in the field in, in so many conflict ridden countries, this guy, has risked his life, his family's life, in order to bring peace between nations, between tribes, between communities. It, he's, a, he's a wonderfully committed Christian. Yeah, he does it. He chose that path because of his commitment to the gospel. Please read some of his books. Yeah, and some of those ideas are very, very applicable to our religious communities. I would just want to highlight one particular model that he proposes in dealing with group conflicts. He says there are three components that we should actually look at. People, the process, and the problem. Now what he says is that very often we don't look, we don't look at all these three. To get a complete picture, we must look at all these three, not just one of them. Sometimes we are so blindsided by the intensity of a problem, we look at just only one or half aspect of this. He says, look at it globally. And that gives you a perfect grip of the issue so that you will be able to have the best solution possible. Now, these are very simple ideas, but something we forget very often. The first component is the people. 
Now, when he says people, he doesn't mean the individual per se. What he means is the psychological and relational dynamics within the individual and among the individuals. Just an example. In the community, let us say, it's an intercultural community of religious. Now there is a problem. And the first component we should sit together, we should become individually aware of, and we should also be aware of as a community is, who are the individuals concerned? This student who has come from, how old is he or she? What is her background? What is her level of psychological maturity? What are some of the cultural biases, everything she might have? And how is the relationship that she, what, how is the relationship she has with other members in the community? So we have to look at individuals and their level of being. So we ask these questions to ourselves. Who are the people involved in this conflict? Now, this could be a community, it could be a province, you know, it's a province assembly happening or a chapter happening. It could be between groups, it could be intraper, it could be interpersonal, intra-group or intergroup, but we already saw the levels of conflicts. So who are the people involved in this conflict? And what are their backgrounds? That's important. What kind of baggage they have? So imagine a community in India where we have people from different castes. We have members from Dalit communities. People have, we have members from upper caste communities. So they are not just individual, you know, they are a legion, like Jesus was, or like the, the, the madman among the tombs told, Je told Jesus here. Very often it's a legion that lives within us to adapt to St. Paul's words. And it's no longer I who live, but my grandfather, my grandmother, my, my, my caste, my race, my, my community that is living in me. So we need to really, really understand and reflect about the individual that he is and the baggage that person carries. Maybe a person from a low caste, they have lots of, you know, difficulty in asserting oneself, expressing the views, maybe suffering intensely with him. He or she might look very calm, but might be burning with him. Maybe poor self-image because traditionally they have suffered a lot and therefore doesn't have the capacity to speak up. Now, are there primary parties and secondary parties involved? Let's say it's a, it's a chapter moment, it's an assembly moment. There are some primary parties involved. Maybe let's say particular ministry, people in a particular ministry are the primary parties. And there might be secondary parties who are actually not in that ministry, but they are somehow related to that ministry. So they have their concerns, not as main concerns, but they still have their investment in that particular issue. So we need to reflect about that. And the third is how do these people perceive the conflict? Do they perceive the conflict as related to people or related to task or related to values? We saw all these. If it is related to people, well, that is the angle we will have to approach. Let us say that the problem is because they have this, they have this problem in their mission, in a particular ministry, not because they have any difficulties in the ministry, but because of, let us say, the provincial. They don't like the provincial, and because of that, they have issues in the ministry. Or they don't like the principal or the director who is heading that particular ministry. So how do they perceive the conflict? And how do perceptions differ between individuals and groups involved? There may be so many differences in perceptions. You know, I have specific, let's say that there is a, there is a province where um, the provincial has to, is asked to resign by let's say the superior general. Now there may be so many groups within that province who have different perspectives, different, so many individuals who have different perspectives, not just two, but five or six or seven perspectives. Some may think that the provincial is wrong, some may think that the superior general is right. Some may think that 
Some may have no idea about what is happening. So it's important to understand the perceptions. Even when somebody communicates, somebody, the one who deals with this issue, let's say in an assembly, has to know where exactly people stand in terms of the knowledge of the facts. So understanding the people from where they come, what baggage they carry, what perceptions they have, and who are the primary parties, who are the secondary parties, all these are important when we deal with a particular conflict. The second is the process. The manner in which decisions are made and how people feel about them. The process of dealing with the conflict. The group's habitual ways of resolving conflicts. So this particular community may have a particular way of dealing with conflicts. And what is their habitual way of dealing with conflicts? We need to understand that. Suppose you are actually invited to mediate, you know, you are from a different congregation or from a different community, you are invited to mediate in the conflicts of a community. You need to be aware of the group's habitual ways of resolving conflicts. Are they using an authoritarian style? Are they using an accommodating style? Are they using a sort of, you know, compromising style? What is their tendency? Is it a top-down unilateral decision-making or is it more democratic? Does everybody count in? Do they hear out everybody? I know of a congregation where there was great tensions in the province because of uh, some caste issues, caste-related issues. Yeah, back in India. Yeah. So what the province did was they delayed the particular chapter and they made space and time for listening to every member, to every community, a democratic process, making sure that everybody counts in, that everybody's voice is heard. You know, sometimes people don't want, people don't, people don't necessarily want that their solutions be accepted. People just want to be heard. People just want to be heard. And taking time to listen to them even if the final decision is not exactly to their 100% liking, they still will be able to live with that decision. So do we have a mechanism for feedback in the process? If these things do not happen, there could be a lot of active aggression. There could be a lot of passive aggression that happens. Yeah? Because we don't, we, as religious, we don't want to be aggressive openly. We become aggressive in very, very, very passive, indirect ways. You know. I remember when I was studying theology, um, some students have a lot of anger towards professors. You cannot take out your anger towards professors. So what do you do? They show it on the desk. They show it on the, on the, on the chairs, you know, slapping the chairs when they get up and go as if the chair is the chair where the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the professor, passive aggression, or it could be just apathy. It could be just apathy. But let me just move on because we are closing in on the time. The finally is the problem. See, the problem comes at the end. So before the problem comes, we should reflect about the persons and the, 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 the process. And when we look at the problems, there are specific issues involved. What are they? How are the parties involved perceive and respond this problem? What are the values, needs, interested, interests, threats, and fears that are connected with this particular problem? What are the major issues in the conflict? Are there hidden issues and needs? Some problems appear to be one particular thing at the surface level, but at the hidden levels, this could be all about so many different issues and needs. What are they? Are there any common interests or needs identified? Or are there vested interests? What are the different ways the problem is manifested? What triggers fears and apprehension? So um, we don't have time to elaborate on this, but these are some of the questions we need to ask about the problem. So it's analyzing the problem. It should actually come last. Before that, we should look at the persons involved because ultimately the problems depend the people, depend on the people and our styles of dealing with personal styles and community styles of dealing with problems. 
Well, talking about the particular problems, see, this is the way problems actually appear. And this I take from Babu Ayindosan, Doe, and Janice Jenner. See, the effects of the conflict, it's like a tree, you know, the effects of the conflict that we see are just, they are, they are the branches that are highly visible. We often see the effects, but effects are just consequences. The core problem is the trunk of the tree. And the causes of the conflict are normally under the earth, invisible. But what we need to address are the causes of the conflict. Now, friends, I'm ending here and I would like to explain the assignments and also what we are going to do next week. These are theoretical ideas that we shared today. They're more about theory. I would like to send you these things. Oh, I need to explain the most work to you. So the PCSI will be sent to you. Please do the test and bring the results to the next session. I'm also sending you my article on conflict resolution in religious communities. Most of the ideas, not everything that I am discussing here are there in that article. Robin will send it to you. Um, that will also prepare you for the following session because some of the skills that I'm going to discuss will be there in summary. We will see that in detail in the next session. I also want you to do the Emmaus work with a community member. And what is this Emmaus work? I'll send you the instructions as to how to do an Emmaus work. What you need to do is choose a member of your community, possibly a member with whom you have some difficulty, yeah, historically of living with. Yeah. It would be ideal because it's easy to talk to friends, you know, you don't have any conflicts normally. Yeah. So choose somebody with whom you haven't actually gotten along well. Now, Emma's work, it's about Luke chapter 24, where two disciples are walking brokenheartedly from Jerusalem to Emmaus, but Jesus joins them as the third, the invisible third. Well, he was visibly third, but he was not recognized. Now, what I want you to do is, and I strongly encourage you to do it because you have a week to go, choose a community member, choose a particular time, mutually convenient, and go for a walk. You know, I suggest 60 minutes, one hour walk, and start sharing with that person at a deeper level. And imagine that Jesus is present with you as the invisible third, and that's what is making it a male's walk. Listening to you, opening your hearts to understanding what is being shared and listened to, giving you a higher level of understanding or a deeper level of understanding, yeah. Now, what do you share? You can share your vocational story or you can share maybe one of your sorrowful mysteries from your life. Maybe some struggle you had, relational struggle <coughs> or ministry struggle or some painful experience you had in your growing up, in your, in your religious life. Yeah, so we are sharing at a deeper level. Share for some 20 to 25 minutes. And then other person talks and you listen. You listen with empathy, you listen with love and respect as if you're walking a holy ground. You listen, receiving the gift of sharing that other person is doing. Now, the confidentiality is very important. Yeah? At the end, you may offer the other person a few insights. Other person may offer to you some insights. Or you may, you may just walk, decide to walk in silence for another 10 minutes in sacred silence, holy silence, being in the presence of the other. 